Hello everyone, I'm David Farzam. Welcome to New Cancer Mentality. New Cancer Mentality is a place where researchers, physicians, innovative thinkers, and patients can share their thoughts in regards to cancer research and trends going on in the field. Today I'm extremely lucky to be joined by my good friend Johnny Immerman. Johnny was diagnosed with testicular cancer a while back and at the time he had friends who supported him along, including his family, but unfortunately he never had anyone there who really could share the same experience he had and who he could learn from as he was going through his treatment. Fortunately, Johnny is an intuitive person and he started the organization Immerman's Angels in 2003 in order to help cancer patients connect one-on-one -on -one so a cancer patient can meet with a cancer survivor who went through a similar situation, be able to talk through the events and help them succeed. So thanks again for being with us today, Johnny. Thank you, David. Flattered to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So first off, Johnny, could you give me a little bit of background on what your life was like before you were diagnosed with cancer and how it all happened, what the original symptoms were at the time? Yeah, you know, I was a regular, normal 26-year-old kid working full-time. I was going to grad school at night. I grew up in the suburban Detroit area. I felt normal. I felt fine. Um, I was going to the gym, you know, several days a week, playing basketball. I mean, I felt 100%. And then one night at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, I felt pain immediately in my left testicle. Very unusual for testicular cancer. Most people don't feel pain. But that pain flipped on like a light switch and stayed on. It alerted me there was a problem. And um, so I limped, literally, and got to my car and drove myself to the hospital. And... Um, Finally, uh, you know, we figured out what was going on. It turned out it was cancer. So the first step was they had to do a surgery called an orchiectomy to remove the left testicle. Then I went into chemo for about five months. I actually banked sperm in between the two of those because there's a good chance you can't have kids naturally. Then after banking sperm and freezing sperm, then I went right into chemo and did chemo for about five months. Chemo worked. My scans were clear. Everything looks on the up and up. A year goes by, I'm starting to build back and get my energy back. And then about 28 or so, I had a recurrence. So I had four tumors and a CAT scan they saw behind my kidneys. And they had to do an 11-inch surgery through my stomach, move things out of the way, all my organs, cut the four tumors out, put all the organs back in, stitch the stomach muscle, and then about 60 staples vertically up and down. But I was lucky enough to beat it for the second time, about 28, 29. And um, clearly, like you said, David, there's a need here. People fight cancer every day, and they have, some of them don't even have families. I did. But a lot of them have friends and families and support, if you're lucky. But the one missing puzzle piece that I didn't have, which very, very few people have fighting cancer, is that they don't know a survivor like them. And as Doug Allman, the CEO of Livestrong, simply put, he said, the number one thing I needed most after my diagnosis was to talk to those who understood. That's exactly right. And he was in his 20s, I think, the first time he was diagnosed. And there's a disconnect. People that get cancer, you should be able to meet someone who's already survived your cancer, who can prove to you it's been done before, and teach you about some of the experiences and side effects you're likely to have, and sort of blaze the road for you, because the trail's already been blazed. Someone farther down the road should be helping you and walking you through the same road. At the time you were diagnosed, how did you go about doing your treatment? I know it was an emergency situation, but did you, did you look to many doctors at the time to try to see which one would be best for you, or did you just choose the first person that came? That's a great question. I went in to three different doctors before we decided to cut the testicle out. It happened so fast, but you've got to know once you cut it out, it's gone. There's no putting it back in. So I went to three doctors, all three separately, said, yes, this is testicular cancer. Yes, the testicle needs to be cut out. And at that point, we felt very confident that that was the right move. And three unbiased separate doctors all agree, cut it out. You know, that's the right move. But that's an important point for the listeners. You know, you got to balance it out. you got to do your homework. you got to speak to a variety of doctors um, before you make any major surgery or start any chemo regimen. You know, do your homework. Make sure that you're making the best decision for yourself. I know you were a pretty active person, and would you say you were 
you followed all the steps of prevention, such as eating right, not smoking, not going in the sun too much. I don't know if these even affect testicular cancer, but I'm guessing everything at the time you were you were pretty doing all those things correctly. Is that right? I really was, David. I'll be honest with you. I was not nearly as fast of a cyclist as Lance Armstrong, but I lived the same lifestyle, but I exercised a lot. I ate healthy all the time. Um, I'm like the Whole Foods guy, right? I mean, that was this is a little bit before Whole Foods, but but that's the lifestyle I live. Go to the gym, played sports, never smoked in my life. I smoked pot like twice in my life. I just never liked it. It wasn't my thing. And I never did any other drugs besides that. And I just was the healthy guy. You know, I've always been lucky to be in shape. And it was the last thing in the world at 26 I thought I would ever get. I mean, the doctor looks at you and says, you have cancer. And you're like, come on. What? Me? Like, it's just the last thing you think. And um, it can happen to anybody. That's the lesson for everybody to learn. You got to do the controllables. You got to take care of your body and eat well and exercise and don't smoke. I mean, those are the top three ways not to get cancer. There's no question. You got to do those things, but you still can't get too confident that you're, you know, um, indestructible because it can't hit even the people that follow all the rules. It can be anybody. Johnny, was the cost of uh, treatment ever an issue for you at the time? Did, did you have health insurance? Uh, could you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, health insurance is a big one. There's a great organization out there called the Patient Advocate Foundation based in Virginia. We work really closely. Emmerman Angels it works closely with every cancer partner out there. We need that. We need collaboration. Um, they do a great job of helping people through their insurance when they can't pay for it. They'll organize their bills for you. They'll go to bat for you with the insurance companies. They're great. I was one of the lucky ones that had insurance. So it was 80-20, my insurance. But you take a bill of 300000 400000 20% you're paying out of your pocket. It's still quite a big sum. And so I actually had to get a lawyer to look at that sum, and a lawyer went in and helped with the hospital, and we negotiated, and we settled on a lower amount, saying, look, here's a 26-year-old kid who's in grad school who's trying to build a career, and I can't come up with you know, X amount of dollars so quickly. And I forget what the overall bill was. It was like sixty or 70000 And they were great, and they worked with me at the hospital. We found a number, and we made a payment plan, and it's done totally behind me. Um, so it can be daunting, though, on some people. It can be really scary. But Patient Advocate Foundation... Um, out of uh, uh, Virginia is a great one. If any listeners need help with insurance questions, they're free and they do a great job. And that's all they do is help cancer people, usually younger cancer people, figure out their insurance bills. And what helped you keep your faith throughout the entire process? I mean, you're so young and at the time you must have been thinking, why is this happening to me of all people? This and just what helped you throughout the entire process just think to yourself, I need to just stay focused and beat this and I can put this behind me. So what helped you the most? Yeah, a lot of things helped me. I wasn't one of those guys that was a why me guy. Like why me, why not someone else? I just, I never looked at it that way. It didn't seem productive to me and it didn't seem fair and it seemed sort of selfish to be totally direct. You know, I went to the cancer center and you see dozens of people around you. I'm like, why this 19-year-old girl who's got brain cancer who has surgery next week in her head? You know, why her? Why this old guy? Why this person? I mean, it, it seemed very of a selfish emotion to think that for me. So I, I really turned to my family and friends. I turned to Lance Armstrong's book, which I read twice, and it totally fired me up. Um, and I turned to the people I loved. I'm one of those lucky guys that has a lot of support and family and friends. You know, the only thing I didn't have was survivor support, and that's why we built Emmerman Angels to make a difference. But um, I turned to those that I knew were very selfless and cared about me, what helped me get to the finish line. So tell me a little bit about Emmerman Angels. What can a cancer patient or a survivor of cancer uh, be expected to see once they enter your website? Totally. If you come to immermanangels.org, which is I-M-E-R-M-A-N, angels.org, all you got to do is come to the website. You can see videos about survivors and fighters that we've helped. You can read about how the program works. 
Um, there's a training manual for survivors you can download. There's a brochure you can download. There's a lot of information. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. You can do all that. Um, we're free. We'll always be free. We're a network of survivors, the angels themselves, over 4,000 strong globally across the planet. We live in all 50 states. We live in over 40 countries, including India, including Uganda, including Uruguay, including Chile. It doesn't matter where you are fighting cancer or where you are as a survivor. You, you call us, you link into us, and basically we built this network so when somebody finds us in Uruguay who's fighting cancer, we find someone we know who's the most similar and then match them, introduce them. So anyone fighting cancer anywhere in the world at any age, any type of cancer, all you got to do is go to our site, you can sign up online, our staff will reach out to you right away. We will match you with the closest match we have. First, we're going to get to know you and talk to you, and then we're going to match you with the closest match so you can meet someone who's three years ahead who says, look, buddy, I'm your big brother. I did this. You're fighting it. I've been there. I get it. I relate. This is what's going to happen to you, and believe me, you're going to get there. There's a finish line. I love what you're doing because I've met so many cancer patients and survivors through this website and I just love that idea that they, they'll be able to give back. I think most of them want to give back and just the idea mm -hmm. that they can help someone who went through a similar situation they did could potentially be really just life changing for them and help them just in all aspects of their lives for the patient and the survivor. Exactly right. It helps all sides. It helps those that are sick and meet a survivor, but it also helps the survivors cope with life after cancer. There's meaning and there's purpose all of a sudden when you're sharing your story, very personalized one-on-one -on -one to help someone else out. It's an amazing bond. And it's an amazing feeling for us, the survivors, that we can make a difference. We can motivate these guys. We can share tips that we learned along the way and the knowledge about pick lines or about ports, about um, cat scans, about whatever, the contrast, getting a, a scan. I mean, there's all so many little things you don't know for the first time survivors know because they've done it and they've lived it. It's the whole, it's all about how do we share what survivors know to help those in the fight today. And then do they tend to interact with one another via email? Do most of them live in a close vicinity when you match them and they're able to meet with each other one-on-one? -on -one? How does that usually tend to work? Great question. If they live in the same city, it's awesome. That's our first goal. I mean, that's our first um, choice. If, let's say, the best match for someone with a really rare cancer lives across the country in Alaska, they can Skype each other. They can email each other. They can call each other. It still works really well. I've really been surprised pleasantly how few people that are fighting cancer, seeking support, care about the location of their survivor. Very, very few, even to my surprise, have asked us, I want someone near me. Sometimes they do, but usually they say, I want a voice. I want a human. I want to know there's somebody out there that I can talk to who beat it. They just want to connect. And distance and meeting in person oftentimes when there's so much going on in the cancer fight, it's not so important. How many survivors does Immerman Angels uh, have right now, and how do you plan on increasing these numbers in the future? We have over 4,000 cancer survivors, over 1,500 caregivers. So caregivers, the mother or father of somebody who beat cancer who wants to help, or sometimes a mother and father who lost a kid who helps another mom who just recently lost a kid. So we match caregivers as well, or spouse to spouse, or brother to brother. I mean, we can do anything, one to one. Um, how are we going to build them? There's three buckets, really. The first bucket is the hospitals. We spend a lot of time talking to doctors, nurses, and social workers, so they send us their survivors and their caregivers. Number two, Patient Advocate Foundation. Live Strong, American Cancer Society. We partner with all these other cancer groups that don't do what we do, and we don't do what they do, so we cross-refer with them. Number three, T-shirts, water bottles, media just like this, any, all the in-betweens to get the word out. Help survivors out there join us, become a part of the solution. C considering you've been through 
testicular cancer. What general tips could you give to other cancer patients right now that you think could help them that that you can just share that you think really helped you along the way? That you know, there there are a few tips, and um, number one tip I would say is to accept that you're not going to be able to go at 100%. When you start chemo or you start radiation, it's hard for a lot of us because we want to feel good and you want to go out. But to, to just trust the survivors that it's going to get better. It's going to get hard and then it's going to get better and you're going to get stronger and you're going to feel good again and the bad taste in your mouth when you eat food is going to go away eventually. That just keep your chin up. You fight hard and life will be better than it was before. Trust us, the survivors. Another tip specifically is if you do get that bad taste in your mouth from chemo, which I did and most people do, lemon heads are amazing. You get these lemon head candies and you suck on these candies and it's so tart lemon that all you can taste is the lemon that you forget about that bad taste. It's a great break. That's a great tip. Um, and I, I think just letting listening to your body is another tip, not trying to, you know, if you work out every day of the week and you're on chemo and you still want to run at the same pace, I just don't think it's worth it. Take a load off. It'll get better in time. That's excellent advice. So thanks again, Johnny, so much for doing this interview with us. I can't thank you enough. If you need anything from us, feel free to just ask, and we're here for you. And um, Thank you so much. To everybody else, please... To, to everyone else, please check out immermansangels.org. Is that correct? You got it. It's immermanangels.org, which is I-M-E-R-M-A-N, angels.org. And again, help us spread the word. You can go to our website. You can buy a T-shirt for $10. They're super cheap. We like keeping it that way so we can get them on the streets. Um, spreading the word, talking to people about it. Everything we do is free. Let's make sure no one fights cancer without the help of a survivor who beat the same thing. Perfect. Thanks again, Johnny, so much, and have a great day. David, thank you. Thank you, buddy. Take care.